you are sitting with the other members of your track and field team in a small room, waiting. Tension fills the air. No one knows why the coaches have called this emergency meeting of the Belgian track and field team. Some of the athletes are less worried. Their events have already taken place. They're done. They're laughing and talking in the back of the room. Your event is still coming up, and with it, your hopes of qualifying for the next Belgium Olympic team. So you sit, waiting, anxious, head down, earbuds in, thinking about your event, visualizing each muscle movement. The coaches enter the room, and a hush falls over those gathered. You take out your earbuds. Their unexpected words turn everyone's hearts to ice water. With this morning's injury, we have no one to run the hurdles this afternoon. I'm sorry, but since we can't compete, our whole team is going to be disqualified. Your Olympic hopes are vanishing before your eyes, not because you didn't train hard enough, not because you did your best and it wasn't good enough, because your team doesn't have someone to compete, so you are being disqualified. You have been counted out without ever entering the fight. Israel has been counted out. They've been in the fight for a lot of years already, but it feels like the hammer already dropped and nobody knows quite when. Gideon is hiding in a wine press. It's an unusual location to find anyone at this time of year, the wheat harvest, and tension fills the air. There's been a lot of tension in the air for the last seven years. Midian has overrun the land of Israel, and so Gideon and his people are hiding out in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Anytime there are crops ready to harvest, the Midianites and the Malachites come and camp out with all their tents, with their flocks of animals beyond numbering, and they wait to steal the crop. Israel has been crying out to God, asking for help. And the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And this prophet said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you did not obey my voice. We meet Gideon in this context. As he is beating wheat in a wine press, he's hiding. He's trying to get this important job done between raids, trying to save the little bit of the wheat harvest that is left. A wine press makes for a terrible threshing floor. And so the job, while getting done, is being done badly. Gideon's head is down, bent over his task, when all of a sudden he hears a voice. He thought he was alone. The unexpected words turn his heart to ice water. The Lord is with you. There's a saying. You might know it. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. That's not my favorite version of the saying. My favorite version of the saying goes like this. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. When I was teaching high school, I tried to get this across to my students. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Not because I was a bad teacher and wanted them to turn in subpar work, 
but because I had a number of students who had very high standards for themselves, and they were failing my class. They were going to have to repeat sophomore Bible. But it was because they would half finish assignments, and they wouldn't think it was good enough, so they wouldn't turn anything in. Well, as your teacher, I am on your side. I want you to pass this class. I will do everything I can. I will give you extra credit. I will stay after class. We can work on things. But if you turn nothing in, I can't give you anything other than a zero. You know what? A half-done paper that gets 35% is a lot better than a zero. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly turn something in. We're back in that room with the Belgium team as the coaches continue to talk, explaining the details to the rules, but you are no longer listening. Everything you have worked towards for so many years, all the hours of training, the time away from family and friends and fun, it feels like all of that is crashing in on you at once. Then, from the back of the room, you hear a voice. Wait, so we just need somebody to compete in the hurdles? The silence descends again. You look back and forth between the speaker and your coaches, who are now quietly consulting together the rule book open before them. Yes, comes the answer. We don't need to place... We just need someone to compete. The voice from the back of the room comes once more, I'll do it. And just like that, she has a new title penciled in behind her name, Jolene Bowompko, Shot Putter Hurdler. Gideon looks up at the tall figure standing on the lip of the wine press, silhouetted against the noonday sun. The voice goes on, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. As the content of the voice's words register, Gideon's shock of being surprised when he thought he was alone is overcome. The Lord? The Lord, it's been seven years. The Lord isn't with any of us. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now, now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Gideon is reading out of a different rule book. He is reading out of the rule book of his experiences, what he sees before him. He hasn't caught up to the divine coach that is calling the shots. There's no way. We're being disqualified. Why do you think I'm in a wine press? And the Lord, other versions say, the angel of the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. I'm not a hurdler, God. I'm a shot putter. The angel says, you don't have to be good. We don't have to place, but we need someone to compete. God chose you. Gideon doesn't realize that in this moment, the angel has just penciled a new title behind his name. Gideon, timorous thresher, mighty man of valor. Jolene Boomko runs the hurdles for the Belgian team, keeping them in the competition. She runs it cleanly, but slowly. 
before she is over the first hurdle, her competitors, slightly sh built, short little women who are tiny compared to Boomko's powerful shot putter build, they're almost a third of the way down the track. She is the last one to finish. But the cheers from the stands are louder for her than for the first place runner. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Judges chapter 6 is the beginning of Gideon's story. And I like Gideon because he has a thick skull. He needs reassurance. He doesn't hear, God has called you a mighty man of valor and say, excellent, let's go do this thing and never look back. No, as we read through the next three chapters of his story, time and again we see miracles and confirmation, and yet he doubts again. An angel has just shown up and told him God's plan, and he asks for confirmation. So the angel provides heavenly fire and then disappears miraculously, and Gideon believes for a while. Then he doubts again. Gideon hears clear instructions from God and he doubts. He continues to ask for confirmation, for assurance, for reassurance. He believes and then he doubts. God keeps giving him another miracle, another confirmation, time after time, confirming that he is what God has called him, that he is Gideon, timorous thresher, mighty man of valor. Sometimes, at least for me, doing something well is the barrier of doing. If I can't turn in the whole assignment that's up to my standard, then I just won't turn it in. If I can't clean the whole house and keep it all pristine and have it done all at once, then I won't even try. If I can't read my Bible for two hours first thing after I wake up and journal and pray perfectly every day, then I just won't start. I won't read it all. But I think we can all agree that a half-done assignment, that partial credit, is better than a zero. That one clean counter and the dishes stacked in half of the sink instead of both sides is better that 10 minutes of reading the Bible or listening to it on my Bible app or just turning off the radio while I'm driving to work and praying at the stoplights, that is so much better than nothing. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly. God pencils a new title beside our names, Hurdler. Mighty warrior, believer. Like Gideon, he calls us by the title he has chosen for us, not the title we have lived up to yet. Courageous, patient, chosen, forgiven, redeemed, disciple. The fact that it is an unexpected or daunting title does not make it untrue. So I ask you this week, what has God called you to? We sang earlier that we are marching to Zion. We're called to move forward in our lives towards God, towards the holy city, towards the resurrection and the second coming. So what should you do this week? What have you been putting off because doing well has been the enemy of doing? You see, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Would you pray with me? Father, we see a reflection of ourselves in Gideon. We see someone who questions, who falters, who needs reassurance. And we thank you for that example because so often in our daily lives, we do not feel like hurdlers or shot putters 
were mighty men of valor. We feel timorous. We feel the doubt and the burdens of life. And we pray, Lord, that we would live in the knowledge that you are with us. That we would know that doing something badly is better than not doing it at all. And that we would live in the titles you have penciled behind our names this week. Amen.